<laughs> All right. I'm using a different translation. I didn't like this one for my sermon. <laughs> The wording is ever so slightly different, and I just don't like it. So I'll be reading from the NIV today. Uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. So <clears throat> this one, as I was preparing my sermon today, I was planning on preaching the next page. And as I was looking at the next page, I just happened to look at the left and thought, I like that passage better. I'm going to preach that one today. And I just threw out what I had been preparing all week. <laughs> and isn't that just the way of it? Paul writes, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And I read that passage. I read that phrase. I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul writes in a lot of his letters how wonderful it is to be free in Christ. We're not under the law. We are under love. Because we love one another, there is no law. Because what law can be higher than love one another? If we follow that, then how are we ever going to get to any of the Ten Commandments? But here, Paul is saying exactly the opposite that I am the prisoner of Christ Jesus. And he does this in all of his letters, too. He contrasts freedom with slavery in every last one of them. And he says it's not for his own sake, but for the sake of the Gentiles. Paul was a Pharisee, and he spent the start of his career persecuting and executing Christians. That's how he became a Christian, was when he had a vision of Christ on the road to Damascus. That is the great revelation of Christ that he had, and he spent three years in the wilderness studying under the risen Jesus. But he wrote to the Corinthians that he had was advancing quickly in the ranks of the Pharisees, that he was quite advanced for his time. And that tells me something. Paul is a very well-educated man. He has credentials. He could be working anywhere. But he is a prisoner of Christ for the sake of the Gentiles. Now, if you're a really good preacher, do you want to be preaching in some backwoods country church to people that can hardly even read their Bibles? Or do you want to be preaching in that really nice church in Iceland that looks like a mountain? <laughs> do you want to be preaching in a great cathedral? And that's what Paul is giving up. He could be one of those great preachers. But instead, He's going to some backwoods country church. He is going out to preach to the Gentiles, throwing his pearls before swine. Because they don't know God. They don't, they don't know what God requires of them. And for the most part, they don't even want God. Because that would mean giving up a lot of the things that they enjoy. Paul is a prisoner of Christ. He is not on the career path he wants. And it is all for the sake of the Gentiles, a people that are not his own. These are not the people when he was going to school, becoming a Pharisee, becoming advanced for his time. These are not the people he thought he would be preaching in front of. But... These are the people that the Lord sent him to. He says, Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by the revelation, as I have already written briefly. 
In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. These are some very strange, this is some very strange wording that Paul is using, but it makes sense because he's writing to Gentiles and they love their mystery cults. They really do. They think that the priest has some, holds all the secrets, that what the gods know, well, that is being um, gatekept by the priests. And Paul is saying, yes, I have all those mysteries. And by the way, I already wrote them down and sent them to you. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? There's no, there is no mystery of Christ anymore. It's all right here on paper. And anyone can read it. Which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. When Irenaeus in the second century was going around preaching, he preached to all the churches that were led by prophets a message. He would receive a prophecy that there should be no more prophecy and that they should follow the elders and the deacons. And so in the first century where Paul is writing, these churches are led by prophets. By the second century, there were no more prophets because the leaders of the churches that were led by elders and deacons went and had such prophetic visions that prophecies should cease. But I find it amazing. I, I, I just, I love to sit in this moment in scripture and think of what that church must have been like. To be receiving revelation from God every week. He says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body. He doesn't say that we become Israel. He doesn't say that we replace Israel. He says that even though we are two nations, we are one body. And this is Paul's vision for the church, that no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, this is one body. This is one family. And he says, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. And he says, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, he's an apostle. Why does he say this? Remember when Jesus said, washed the disciples' feet, and he says, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom, you must be the least. You must be willing to serve. And Peter said, Lord, not my feet. You can't do this. And when Jesus ex explained this to him, if you want to be the greatest, you must be the least. And he said, then not my feet, but my whole body as well. This is, this is Paul living that example. He wants to be the least. Even though he's an apostle of Christ, he wants to be the least in the whole church. And he says, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the ad administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Right here, we see him referring to that example of how the Christ we got was not the Christ we wanted. When Christ came to earth, people were expecting a military leader, a new King David, who is going to take back Israel and kick out the Romans. And he was going to establish heaven on earth. And don't you know, there would be no Gentiles in it. Well, this would be an empty church if that happened. But 
That's not the kind of savior we got. What we got was a savior who went through the scripture and lived it and showed us how to do it right, how to live God's will. And the irony is when he died on the cross, he died the death of a rebel. When Pilate brought him before the people, he said, do you want this murderer of Romans, Barabbas, or this insurrectionist, Jesus? Which insurrectionist do you want? The one that's worth nothing or the one who I'm told is your leader? And they said, give us the one that's worth nothing. If Pilate didn't know Jesus was innocent before that, he certainly did after. Because if Jesus was the, <clears throat> excuse me, because if Jesus were the leader of an insurrection, wouldn't they want him back? <laughs> wouldn't he be more valuable than Barabbas? But they hung him on a cross as a traitor, as a rebel, as a freedom fighter, an insurrectionist. And they hung him between two others for the same crime. That is the irony of Christ's death that they hung him for the crime that they expected him to commit. <laughs> and that was why it was a great mystery, because otherwise it wouldn't have happened. And he says that it should be made known to the rulers, to the authorities of the heavenly realms. He is talking not only of the gods, of God, of the devil, of the pantheon of gods that exist, but he's also talking politics because in that day, Caesar declared himself a god. So don't you know there's no separation of religion and politics in Paul's days? He says the rulers and authorities, and he not only means the gods, but he also means the politicians. <laughs> You might read that passage one more time, looking for that meaning. It's really interesting. According to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are for your glory. Paul is a prisoner of Christ, <clears throat> and he is doing so because it leads people to freedom, that they are free of the powers of this world and of the powers of the next, that they, that they are a community and a body united by one God. But I can't just let that sit, that Paul is a prisoner of Christ. It still bothers me. And I consider what he's a prisoner to. Because we serve a God that doesn't bind us under a law, that doesn't bind us to an institution, or even to an, a single nation. He doesn't bind us to anything but love. Because God is love. And that was the message that, that Christ preached. I want to ask you a question. Can you be a prisoner to love? You can if it's right. And in fact, that is the greatest freedom, isn't it? And when we put it in that context, everything that Paul says about being a prisoner to Christ, being free in Christ, it all makes sense because he is, a pre he is preaching a gospel, not of law, not of authority, but of love. And when you're in love, oh boy, aren't you a prisoner to it. So when I read Paul, that's the context that I read him in. Yes, he speaks of slavery and he speaks of freedom. And it's not because they are polar opposites. It's because in love, they're one and the same.
So with that in mind, let's pray. Father, we thank you for setting aside these mysteries for us, for your people whom you have called from every nation under the sun, Lord. Lord, we pray that you've saved a few for us for today, for next week, and for every time that we come to you in your word and in prayer. Lord, we pray that your light shine through us to everyone we meet, that we brighten every corner of our world, that everyone will know that you are love, that you are God, and in you there is freedom, there is justice, and there is, above all, love for every one of your children. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>